Marquis de Sade Francois Alphonse de Sade, June 2, 1740 to December 2, 1814, is a French novelist, playwright, political activist, and nobleman. He was born into a family of noble origin dating back to 13th century. Saad was an officer during the Seven Years' War, but his sexual misdeeds led to his imprisonment for various crimes, including sex, blasphemy, and pornography. He wrote a number of novels and short stories between 1777 and 1790, with some of them being smuggled out by his wife. After his release, he embarked on a literary career, as well as political involvement, initially as an advocate of constitutional monarchism and later as a radical republican. During the Reign of Terror, Saad was imprisoned for moderation and narrowly avoided guillotines. In 1801, he was arrested again for pornographic novels and spent the rest of his life in the insane asylum of Charenton, where he died. His most well-known works are The 120 Days of Sodom, Justine, Juliet and Philosophy in the Bedroom, which contain graphic descriptions of sexual acts, rape, tortures, murders and child abuse, as well as discourses on politics, sexuality and philosophy. The term sadism is derived from his fictional characters, who enjoy the infliction of pain on others. How criminal and sadistic was Sada's behavior? According to Peter Marshall, Sada's known behavior, which only includes the beating of a maid and an orgy of several prostitutes, deviates significantly from the clinical view of active sadism. However, Dworkin argues that the question is whether you believe Saad or his accusers of sexual assault. Saad's reputation rose to prominence in the 20th century, with many authors citing him as a forerunner of Nietzsche, Freud, surrealism, totalitarianism, and anarchism. Numerous biographies and plays have been published, including the play Marat slash Saad by Peter Weiss, and Salo, or The 120 Days of Sodom by Pier Paolo Pasolini. Dworkin and Roger Shattuck criticize Sada's rehabilitation of his reputation, claiming that it encourages violent pornography that could harm women, the young, and unfit minds. Life Early life, education, and marriage, 1740-1763 Born on June 2, 1740 in Paris, Saad was the only child of Jean-Baptiste François Joseph, Count de Saad, and Marie-Eloise de Males de Carmen, a provincial noble family dating back to the 13th century. His mother was a member of a minor branch of the House of Bourbon, and Saad was a blood relative of the French king. His father was a captain of dragoons who had been sent on diplomatic missions to Russia, Great Britain, and the electorate of Cologne. His mother was lady-in-waiting to the Princess of Condé. For Sada's first four years of life, he lived with his grandmother, who had sent him to Avignon in 1744, probably after he had quarreled with a playmate. The four-year-old Louis Joseph, Prince of Condé. Young and spoiled, Saad was prone to violent outbursts. The following year, 1750, Saad was given up for adoption by his father, who had fallen into debt and was no longer able to provide him with a residential student. Saad was probably living in private with his uncle, the Abbé de Saad, who was a priest and a liberal. The Abbé d'Amblet had been named as Saad's tutor and Saad had grown to admire him. The Count had lost the King's favor and had been dismissed from his position in Germany, and his career was in shambles. His wife had left him and he was living in a convent of Carmelites in Paris. At the end of the 1750 season, 1751, Saad was 10 years old and enrolled at the Jesuit College in Paris where he studied Latin, Greek, and rhetoric, as well as taking part in the school's theatrical productions. Residential students weren't allowed to mix with outside students, and this may have isolated him from his wealthy peers. Some biographers dispute whether Saad was subjected to caning or sodomy during his school years, and whether this had an impact on his sexual growth. During his summer vacation, Saad spent time at the Chateau de Longeville near the Champs-Élysées, where he met Madame d'Esté Germain, for whom he would remain in love for the rest of his life. Both women would become Saad's mother figures. Saad was enrolled in the military academy at the Chateau de Chavot in 1754. After two and a half years of training, on December 14, 1755, at the age of 15, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the King's Foot Guard. 
At the start of the Seven Years' War, Saad went to battle. After 13 months of service, Saad was promoted to a cornet in the a Brigade de Saint-Ange of the Countess de Provence's Carbine Regiment on January 14, 1757, and again on April 21, 1759, when he was promoted to captain in the Burgundian Cavalry. Saad developed a reputation for being a good soldier, but he was also a gambler, a spendthrift, and a libertine, all of which. The Seven Years' War ended in February 1763 with the Treaty of Paris, and Saad was released. He returned to Paris, living a life of luxury while his father, who was ill and deeply in debt, considered going into monastic life to avoid having to welcome his son, with whom he was unhappy. Saad's father had also been negotiating for him to marry his eldest daughter, René Pelage. The Montreals, who were of bourgeois origin and had not been ennobled until 17th century, were wealthy and had powerful connections at court and in the legal world. The Count regarded his son as a financial burden and a bad character. Saad wrote, As far as I am concerned, I will get rid of the boy who has none of the good qualities and all the bad qualities. After two months of courting, Saad fell in love with the Count's daughter, Lord Dolores. However, he was angry and threatened to blackmail her by accusing her of impregnating another young man she was courting. Although Saad declared that he would marry only for love, he refused to marry René Pelage and did not appear at court on May 1, 1763. The following day, May 15, 1763, René and Saad signed the marriage contract, and the following day, May 16, 1763, they were married. The couple lived in the rooms rented by René's parents at the Hotel de Montreuil in Paris. At first, Saad was delighted with his new wife. I don't know how to thank her, he wrote to his uncle two years later. She is too cold, and too devout. René bore him two sons, one of whom he fathered a daughter. She later became complicit in his alleged crimes against adolescents. Scandals and Imprisonment, 1763-1790 Tester affair and Aftermath In 1763, four months after his marriage, he was charged with blasphemy and sacrilege, both capital crimes. He rented a house in Paris and used it for sex. On October 18, 1763, he hired a prostitute, Jean Testard, who told police that she was locked in a bedroom by Saad, who asked her if she was religious. She said she was, and Saad told her that there was no God. He then asked her to perform sodomy, also a capital offense. She said she did not want to. He then told her that he would beat her with a cane or an iron scourge heated by fire if she refused to trample on the crucifix and shout obscenities. She said she would, but she would not. Saad forced her to spend the night with him, and he read her an irreligious poem. On the morning of October 29, 1763, Tester told the police that she had been locked in the bedroom by Saad. Saad was then arrested on the orders of the king and imprisoned in the prison of Vincennes. Saad wrote several letters of apology to the authorities, pleading for mercy and requesting a visit to a priest. After pleading for mercy with his father, Saad was released on November 13, 1764. Saad was then sent to live at his father's estate at Montreal, Echaufort, in Normandy. In 1764, the king lifted Saad's banishment and the Marquis returned to Paris, where he engaged in a series of affairs. In 1765, Saad took his then fiancée Madame Beauvoisin to his favorite castle, Lacoste in Provence, at the end of the summer, where he introduced her as his wife, much to the chateau's chateau owner's chagrin. The following year, Saad spent much of his time renovating Lacoste. In 1767, his first son Louis Marie was born on August 27. Arcule Affair and Aftermath On Easter Sunday, April 3, 1768, Saad accosted a 36-year-old widow by the name of Rose Keller, who had been begging in front of a Parisian inn. Keller claimed that Saad asked her to work for him as a housemaid. Saad then took her to his country home at Arcule and locked her up in a room, telling her that if she didn't take off her clothes he would kill her. He tied her to a bed and beat her with a stick or cat o' nine tails, according to Keller, who also said that he cut her with his penknife and burned her with hot wax. 
He also said that he had a knife in his hand and that if she wouldn't stop screaming he would kill her, and that he would give her food and lock her up in an upper room. She escaped through a window and went to the police that night. The next day, the local magistrate opened an inquiry into the matter, and on April 7, 1768, word of the affair made its way to Madame de Montreal. The following day, she sent representatives to Arcule and paid Keller a small sum of money to withdraw the complaint. On April 8, Saad was arrested by the king on a royal writ of arrest and detention without charge. He was imprisoned at the Château de Saumur and later at the prison of Pierre Incise. The criminal chamber of the Paris Parliament took up the case on April 15 and soon issued a warrant for Saad's arrest. On June 3, Saad was granted a pardon by the king, probably at the request of his family. Saad was then questioned by the Parliament on June 10. Saad claimed that Keller was a willing prostitute and that he had not tied her down, cut her with a knife, or burned her with hot wax. He also claimed that Keller had not complained of flagellation that day. The Parliament accepted Saad's pardon and ordered him to pay a fine of 100 livres for each prisoner. On the same day, Saad was put back in prison at Pierre Incise under the writ of arrest. On November 16, Saad was freed by the king on condition that he remain under surveillance at Lacoste. The story of the Arcule affair became well known, and the Saad family and the families of the Montreal family worried about their reputation. René Pelagé had a second son in June 1769. The Montreals thought this would help Saad to become a better man. Saad returned to the Burgundy Regiment in July 1770, where he was met with some resistance. Saad was appointed Master of Cavalry in March 1771, which was considered an official rehabilitation. The following year, his daughter Madeline was born. Saad was heavily in debt and had to sell his commission, but this did not prevent him from spending a short time in debtor's prison. On November 1771, Saad was at Lacoste with his sister, Anna Prosper. It is said that Saad had a fatal passion for his sister and that they had a sexual relationship. In the following year, Saad devoted much of his time to theatrical productions in Lacoste and Mazin. He spent large sums of money hiring professional actors and constructing elaborate sets. Marseille's Affair and Aftermath Saad traveled to Marseilles in June 1772 with his manservant, Latour, under the pretense of seeking a loan. On June 27, 1772, he and Latour embarked on an elaborate orgy with four female prostitutes. During the orgy, they engaged in sexual intercourse and flagellation, as well as what some witnesses claim to have been active or passive sodomy between Saad and one of the female prostitutes. Saad then offered the female prostitutes anise-flavored, Spanish-fly-laced pastilles. One of the female prostitutes, Marianne Laverne, fell ill after consuming the pastilles. Later that evening, Saad and Laverne had sex with another female prostitute, Marguerite Coste. Laverne filed a complaint to the police, and after an investigation, they issued a warrant for Saad's arrest on the charge of sodomy, as well as that of poisoning. Saad went into hiding, and his wife offered to pay Laverne and Laverne to withdraw their complaints against him. On September 2, 1772, the Marseilles court, in Aix, confirmed the sentence of death in absentia for Saad and for Latour. By 1773, Saad was living in Italy with and Prosper, a relationship which made her an enemy of his. Saad wrote to his mother-in-law from Italy, informing her of his whereabouts, and she took advantage of her influence to have him arrested and imprisoned at the fort of Milans in what is now the Italian province of Milans. Saad managed to escape from the fortress on April 30, 1773, and made his way back to France. In January 1774, Saad was warned of an impending police raid on his house in Lacoste, which had been set up by Madame. Following Louis XV's death in May 1789, Madame had obtained a new writ of arrest for Saad in the name of Louis XVI. At the same time, René Pelagé filed an appeal against her husband's death sentence. Lacoste Affair and Aftermath Saad hired seven new female servants for his Lacoste mansion in September 1774. 
They included a young man, a young man's secretary, and five girls, all of whom were about 15 years old. Saad, with his wife's permission, had several orgy with his female servants. The details of the orgies are unknown, but it is likely that they included sexual intercourse, flagellations, and floggings. The families of the girls filed a complaint in January 1775 accusing Saad of kidnapping them and seducing them. A criminal investigation was opened in Lyon, and Sada's wife arranged for the girls to go to convents. Three of the girls were sent to the convent, and one of them was sent to the Abbey of Saad, where she died a few months after. In June 1774, a servant, named Nanan, quarreled with the Saad and left, seeking refuge in a monastery, where she stayed for more than two years. Nanan was accused of stealing from the Saad family and was imprisoned in Alls, where she remained until her wounds healed. Nanan was arrested and imprisoned at Alls where she remained for over two years. In July, Saad, fearing arrest, left for Italy where he remained for a year. Trial at Affair and Imprisonment Saad returned to Lacoste in June 1776 to write a travel book, Voyage d'Italie. That summer, he employed three young women as his servants, including 22-year-old Catherine Trilet. In December, he hired four more. Three of them departed after one night, alleging that Saad had propositioned them for money for sex. Trilet's father told his daughter's father in January 1777 that he was coming to Lacoste for his daughter. Trilet fired a shot at Saad from close range, but missed. After a second shot, Trilet left the scene and filed a complaint against Saad for kidnapping and seduction. On February 8, 1777, Saad received a letter from his mother's sister-in-law in Paris, telling him that she was critically ill. On February 13, 1777, he and his wife arrived at Lacoste, where they found that their mother had been dead for three weeks. They were arrested under the existing Lelera de Cachet and imprisoned at the Vincennes Fort. Now in custody, Saad appealed his conviction on sodomy and poisoning to the Parlement de Provence in Aix, and on June 30, 1778 the court annulled the sodomy conviction and ordered Saad to be retried on charges of pederasty and debauchery. Wishing to avoid the shame of a criminal conviction within the family, Madame had a representative sent to Marseilles to bilk the prostitutes and other witnesses. After hearing Saad and several witnesses, on July 14, 1778 the appeals court annulled Sada's sodomy conviction and found him guilty only of debauchery and at a moderate libtonage and sentenced him to a fine and three years banishment from the city of Marseilles. Saad was immediately remanded to police custody, but escaped custody while being transported back to Paris, returning to Lacoste Chateau. On August 26, 1778, Saad was arrested again after a raid on his chateau and sent back to police custody. During his time in jail, Saad wrote many letters, mostly to his wife. He continued to write Voyage d'Italie, 1782, and several plays. In 1782, Saad wrote the dialogue between a priest and a dying man. In 1784, Vincennes' jail was closed and Saad moved into the Bastille, where he wrote a full-length version of the 120 Days of Sodom, 1789, which many critics regard as his first great work. Saad wrote a novel, Aline Eti Valcor, 1787, and completed two novellas, 1787 and 1788, and a third novelette, 1789. As revolutionary tensions rose in Paris, he was angry that his daily routine was being reduced. On July 2, 1789, Saad used his megaphone to shout to passers-by below that prisoners were being killed by warders. On July 14, 1789, a revolutionary mob stormed the Bastille, and Saad's former cell was ransacked and his personal belongings were stolen. On April 2, 1790, he was released from custody after the National Constitution Assembly voted to abrogate the laws governing the prison. Freedom and Imprisonment, 1790-1801 Upon his release, Sada's wife filed for divorce and the marriage was annulled in 1790. In August 1790, Saad began a relationship with the 33-year-old actress, Marie Constance, which lasted until his death. Saad changed his name to Louis Saad, Man of Letters, 
and tried to establish himself as a writer. He published his first novel, Justine or the Misfortunes of Virtue, anonymously in 1791. In March 1792, his play, Le Subornaire, was performed at the Italian's theater, but it only ran for a single night when Jacobin protesters blocked the show. In October, Sada's play Oxtiern was performed at the Moliere's Theater in Paris, but it was closed after two performances due to an audience outcry. Saad became increasingly involved with politics, initially supporting a constitutional monarchy, but as Republican sentiment rose in 1792. He found himself in political trouble due to his noble background, public support for the monarchy, and his emigration of two of his sons. He began to express more radical Republican views publicly and became a prominent member of the Section de Piques. After the French Revolution in 1789, Saad became the Section's Commissioner for Health and Philanthropy in 1792. In October 1793, he delivered the oratorio for the funeral of Marat, one of the revolution's martyrs. In November 1794, Sada's section ordered him to deliver an anti-religion petition before the National Convention, where Robespierre, other members, and the Convention's powerful Committee of Public Safety sought to clamp down on atheism and assaults on religion. Saad was arrested in December 1794, accused of moderatism, association with counter-revolutionaries, opposition to republicanism, and feigned patriotism. He was put on death row on July 27, 1794, Thermidor, but was saved from execution by a combination of bribes and bureaucratic blunders. The following day, Robespierre fell from power, ending the reign of terror and allowing Saad to be released from jail in October 1795. Upon his release from prison, Saad turned his attention to literature and personal matters. He wrote several anonymous novels, Philosophy in the Bedroom, 1795, Aline and Valcor, 1797 and the first two volumes of the novel, The New Justine and Juliet, 1798-99. Saad was in dire financial straits, with little or no income from his estates, and his name was erroneously placed on the list of enforcers of the French directory, which made him vulnerable to arrests and confiscations. In 1796, Saad sold Lacoste but his ex-wife took most of the money. In 1798 Saad tried unsuccessfully to persuade Paul Barris, the directory's leader, to remove his name from the list, and his status as an informer was revoked in December of the same year. By this time, Saad had sunk deeper into poverty, and was registered as an indigent. In 1800, he wrote Crimes of Love, a collection of his own short stories. The book was met with unfavorable reviews. Final Imprisonment and Death 1801 to 1814. In 1801, the Napoleonic Consulate began to crack down on public obscenities, and Saad was arrested in March 1801 at his publisher's office and imprisoned in the prison. The stocks of his plays, The New Justine and Juliet, were confiscated, and the police minister, Joseph Fouché, ordered Saad's arrest without trial, believing that the pornography laws didn't provide enough punishment and that a trial would only make Saad more famous. Saad was declared insane with libertine dementia and transferred to the Thvicetor Asylum after intervention from his family, where they agreed to pay for his room and board. And his ex-wife, Marie Constance, his illegitimate daughter, was permitted to live with him. The director of the Charenton, now the Chateau, tried to run the institution humanely, focusing on moral treatment according to the nature of the man's mental illness and allowing him to write, produce, and perform in plays. Kulmier also encouraged him to attend balls, in 1805, Saad built a theater on the premises, seating about 200 people. The theater's performances, which featured professional actors and prisoners, became popular with the elite of the Napoleonic society, and Saad was allowed to write. In April 1807, Saad completed a ten-volume novel, Les Journes de Florbelle. The novel was confiscated after police searched Saad's and Quesnit's rooms. Saad went on to write three more conventional novels while at Charenton. Saad's novel approach to psychoanalysis and the privileges he was granted by Kulmir aroused much criticism in official circles. 
New police orders in 1810 placed Saad in solitary confinement and confiscated his pens and paper, but Kulnir gradually restored most of his privileges. In 1813, Kulnir was ordered by the government to suspend all theatrical productions, balls, and concerts. By 1814, Saad had fallen seriously ill and was in bed with the teenage daughter of one of the employees at Charenton's. The following day, September 1814, Kulmir requested the Bourbon Restoration Government that Saad be transferred to another institution. Saad died. In his will, Saad requested that he be buried on his estate at Malmazone, without an autopsy or pomp of any kind. However, Malmazone was sold many years later and Saad was interred with religious rites in Charenton. His skull was later taken from the grave for a phrenological study. Claude Armand, Saad's son, burned all of his unpublished works, including his Les Journées de Florbel. Controversy Marshall argues that Saad's known conduct, which includes but is not limited to the beating of the housemaid and the orgy with a number of prostitutes, deviates significantly from the clinical description of active sadism. Phillips argues that there is no evidence that any of these acts involved compulsion. Dworkin argues that it is a question of believing Saad or believing his women accusers. And that Saad admirers tend to rationalize, trivialize or deny all of the assaults Saad has ever carried out on women and girls. Gray argues that Saad committed psychic terrorism and that Saad's style of sadism has often been more mental than physical. Bongi argues that Saad carried out crimes of physical violence during sexual assaults upon hapless prostitutes. These assaults, exacerbated by death threats, and with the element of recurrent recidivism could easily put an offender in the same situation today. Political, Religious and Philosophical Views John Phillips argues that it is difficult to determine Sada's views because of the difficulty of distinguishing one authorial voice from the tens of thousands of characters in his fiction. Even in his letters, Saad was playing a role that leads to the ultimate impossibility of identifying his true character through his writing. Saad's arguments to justify his character's more extreme behavior are often satirical, parodic and ironic. According to Jeffrey Gore, Saad stood against contemporary thinkers because of his complete and continuous denial of the right of property and because he saw the political conflict in the late 18th century France as not between. The crown and the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy and the clergy and the sectional interests of each of them against one another, but rather all of them more or less united against one another. Gore argues that Saad can, with some justification, be considered the first reason socialist. Peter Marshall argues that Saad was a pioneer of anarchism, in that he was a libertarian in that he wanted to expand human freedom and envisioned a society without. Marshall argues that Saad supported the establishment of free, state-run brothels in order to decriminalize sex crimes and to satisfy popular desire to be ordered about and obeyed. Dworkin argues that this was a proposal for compulsory prostitution as early as childhood, in which women and girls would be forced to rape by men. The proposal is made by one of the characters in Saad's novel, Philosophy in the Bedroom, Le Chevalier. Phillips argues that Sada's views on his characters cannot be entirely attributed to him. Lever, Bongi, and Gray portray Saad as an opportunist, with only his principles of liberty, atheism, abolition of the death penalty, defense of his property, and support of the constitutional monarchy. After the revolution, he publicly supported republicanism, only to avoid arrest as a pro-monarchist. According to Lever and Bongi, Saad was an unrepentant moderate, horrified by the excesses of politics. In 1951, Albert Camus wrote that Saad put the sex drive at the heart of his thought. Camus argued that the sex drive is natural but a blind power that dominates man. Camus went on to argue that the overthrow of a king by divine right in 1792 meant the abandonment of the system of laws and morality sanctioned by God and the sovereign. Saad, on the other hand, defended absolute moral license which allowed passions to dominate. If the satisfaction of passions leads to crimes like murder, then that complies with the law of nature, because destruction is required for creation, Camus wrote. But if murder is permitted, all are in danger of being murdered. 
Camus argues that absolute freedom must involve the struggle to dominate. In Camus' view, Sot stood for freedom of desire for the few, which required the slavery of the majority. Phillips argues that Saad predicted totalitarianism in its name. La Metri's materialism. Hallback's materialism. Hume's determinism. God does not exist. Man and the universe are nothing but matter. Infinite decay. Finite reconfiguration. Free will. Everything has a cause. As a result, the character of the libertines is determined by nature and there is no point in punishing them for something they are not responsible for. Sada's liberal thinkers sometimes see nature as an enemy of God, seeing it as a destructive power whose laws must be followed, but also see it as a rival of their own power. According to historian Lester Crocker, Sod is the first to construct a complete system of total nihilism, including all its implications, consequences, and consequences. Saad held that morality is only human conventions, and that individuals have the right to disregard laws and moral principles that conflict with the laws of nature, and to pursue natural passions and goals that are in harmony with nature. Saad's liberal thinkers argue that human virtues, such as charity, compassion and respect for parents, are contrary to nature and should be avoided, while murder and stealing are natural passions that should be pursued. For Saad, Human value is the egoistic pursuit of the passions, with the primary passion being the sex drive. For Sada's free thinkers, crime isn't just a means to gain and maintain power, it's a pleasure. They create a hierarchy of the joys of crime, the act of not helping those in need gives them the least pleasure, and the act of torturing and murdering children gives them the most. Crocker argues that Saad predicted Freud in placing the sex drive at the top of the agenda and associating it with destructive impulses. However, his nihilism strikes Crocker as internally contradictory, Saad distributes values from nature and assigns one human value to it, contrary to Freud's claim that there is no objective moral law, and leaves open the possibility of other human values and moral laws that are derived from nature. Critical Reception the critics of the time were generally unfavorable. When Sada's play, Oxtiern, was first performed in 1791 the critic in the journal Moniteur wrote, The play is interesting and full of energy, but the villain is an abomination. The anonymous characters of Justine and Juliet were regarded as obscenities. A review in the journal Justine said that Sade showed brilliant imagination, but that it is hard not to close the book with a feeling of disgust and outrage. There were rumors that Danton or Robespierre had used Justine to aid in masturbation and to increase their desire for blood. In 1798, the French writer Retif had published an anti-Justine. By 1800, many authors were referring to Justine as Justine by Saad. The critic in Crime of Love called Saad a terrible book written by the man suspected of writing a worse one. The generally unfavorable reception of Saad continued throughout the 19th century. Crime of Love While Baudelaire and Flaubert, among others, admired Saad's work, Swinburne thought it was humorously absurd. And Anatole France wrote that their most dangerous component is a fatal overdose of dullness. In 1886, the sexual psychologist Kraft Hedman treated Saad's work as a compilation of sexual perversions and gave the term sadism its clinical connotation. Saad's reputation rose to prominence in the 20th century. There are many different Saadists that have been created over the years, says his biographer Lawrence Louise Bongi. And they are almost always opposed to one another, or even to one another's definitions of the man. In 1909, the French novelist and playwright Apollinaire described Saad as the freest soul that has ever lived, while the French playwright André Breton described him as a surrealist in sadism, committed to total liberation, both socially and morally. Others see Saad as a forerunner of Nietzsche and Freud. Writing shortly after World War In her 1951-52 essay, Must We Burn Saad? 1951-52, Saad was described as a second-rate writer and unreadable, but his value lies in forcing us to reconsider the nature of man's relationship to man. 
Critical attention to Sada's work increased in the 1960s, when his work was made available in non-urgent editions across France, the US, and the UK. Roland Barthes, in 1971, published an important textual analysis of Saad, among others, Fourier and Loyola, which largely rejected psychological, social, and biographical readings of Saad. Several prominent female critics have defended Saad. In 1978, Angela Carter wrote that Saad offered pornography as a service to women by asserting their right to free sexuality and by showing them in powerful positions. Camille Paglia, in 1990, wrote that Saad was a, hardly a philosopher, but rather a satirist, who, responded point by point to Rousseau's assertion that society impairs and corrupts humanity. According to Annie Lebrun, Saad's emphasis on sex and the body should be seen as poetry, and, he has been best understood by poets. On the other hand, Dworkin argues that, women are by nature prostitutes and men by nature rape women and that the female liberationist enjoys power only as the male liberationist imagines it, and only as she adopts violent male sexuality. Roger Shattuck wrote in 1990 that those who purport to rehabilitate sod place too great an emphasis on abstract concepts of transgression or linguistic play or irony, and neglect the sexual violence that is at the heart of his work. Shattuck went on to argue that Sada's works are probably harmful to the young and unformed minds. In 1996, Shattuck wrote that Saad was included in the reputation of literature in France, a privilege equivalent to an artist being admitted to the Louvre. He said that Saad's writings are probably dangerous to the young and unformed mind. French intellectual Michel Onfray says that it is absurd to make a hero out of Saad, even though his most hero-obsessed biographers say he was a sexual pervert. Cultural Influence Crocker traces Sada's intellectual impact to 19th century writers like Stendhal and Baudelaire, as well as thinkers like Stirner and Nietzsche, but he argues that Saad had the greatest impact on the 20th. In 1963, Crocker wrote, Saad speaks to our time, for it is our age which has had to experience the truths he revealed. The failure of rationalism revealed by history and psychology has plunged our art and often our lives into the abyss of nihilism. Sexual sadism disorder, as named after Saad, is a mental condition in which sexual arousal is elicited by non-consensual acts of pain, suffering, or humiliation, as Saad describes in his novels. There are various terms used to describe this condition, and it may overlap with other forms of sexual pleasure that involve inflicting pain. This is distinct from situations in which consenting individuals use pain or suffering for sexual pleasure. After the Second World War, Saad began to attract the attention of intellectuals such as George Baudelaire and Michel Foucault as well as Camille Paglia, among others, as an early thinker in the fields of sexuality, body, transgression, and nihilism. Farr argued that Saad's writings, particularly his essay, Philosophy in the Bedroom, had a lasting impact on the medical and social acceptability of abortion in Western societies. Dworkin argued that Saad only described abortion as a kind of murder which he had sexized. He had more often argued in favor of murdering pregnant women. Phillips argued that the sexual liberation in the 1960s was due to complex social factors and access to the contraceptive pill, rather than Saad's ideas. The American edition of Saad's work has been commercially successful since it became available for free in the 1960s, selling 350,000 copies between 1965 and 1990, and 4,000 copies per year between 1990 and 1996. According to Shattuck, Sada's cultural rehabilitation after World War II was a sadistic death wish. He argues that Sada's moral nihilism has infiltrated our cultural bloodstream at both the highest intellectual and criminal levels. Phillips, on the other hand, argues that Sada's enduring legacy lies in the replacement of theological readings of the world by materialist humanism, thus contributing to a modern intellectual climate in which absolutism is viewed with suspicion. Saad has been included in the French literary canon, and has been read and admired by such serial killers as Ian Brady, 1961, and Ted Bundy, 1962. In the early 20th century, Saad and his life and work gained more cultural attention, particularly from surrealists, 
Breton, A. Loire, and Man Ray, 1954. Saad and his themes were also represented in art and film by Man Ray and Salvador Dali, 1954 film Salo and Amarat Saad, 1954 play by Peter Weiss. Mishima, 1965 film Madame de Saad and Salo, film Pasolini, 1965, and Quills. Libertine Novels Sada's most well-known novels are his so-called Libertine Novels, which are characterized by graphic descriptions of sexual acts and violence, as well as long, didactic passages where his characters grapple with the moral, political, and philosophical consequences of their actions. In these novels, Sada's protagonists engage in a variety of transgressions, such as blasphemy, sexual acts, and sodomy, as well as coprophilia and necrophilia, as well as adult and child rape, torture, and murder. The Libertines claim that these transgressions are in accordance with the natural order of things. Among his most well-known Libertine novels, there are also elements of pornography and gothic fiction, as well as moral and didacticism, dark tales in the style of the Brothers Grimm, as well as social, political, and literary satire. The most important Libertine novels written by Saad include, The 120 Days of S. Sodom, written in 1785, first published in 1899, Justine, in two versions published in 1791, Philosophy in the Bedroom, 1795, Philosophy in Other Novels and Tales. Sada's first major work as a writer of fiction was the dialogue between a priest and a dying man, written in 1782, while he was in jail. The dialogue is not pornographic, but outlines some of Sada's major themes, such as the non-existent God, the semi-divine nature of nature, materialism, determinism, the eternal state of living matter, the relativistic and pragmatic morality, the defense of liberalism, etc. While in jail, Saad wrote an epistolary novelette, Aline E.T. Valcor, 1795, and a novella, The Misfortunes of Virtue, 1798, which he expanded into two versions, Justine E.D. Gange, 1812-13. He wrote about 50 stories, 11 of which were published under his name in a collection, The Crimes of Love, in 1800. The stories are not pornographic, but contain themes of incest, liberalism, and disaster. Plays Theater was a lifelong passion for Saad, and he wrote around 20 plays during his first extended imprisonment. Oxtiern, Le Subornaire, and several others were staged professionally upon his release, and a few more were staged semi-properly while he was in the Charenton Asylum. Sada's reworked melodramas for the theater have so far attracted little critical attention and are unlikely to do so in the future, writes critic John Phillips. Essays and Political Tracts Saad wrote the preface to his collection, The Crimes of Love, which was published in 1800. In the preface, Saad reviews the evolution of the novel from the classical era through the 18th century, and gives advice to aspiring novelists. Saad's advice to writers includes, don't go beyond what is possible, don't interrupt the plot with repeated or tangential events, leave all moralizing to your characters, and don't write primarily for profit. Phillips and Edmund Wilson Sada's political writings include Address to the King, 1791, Idea on the Method for the Condemnation of Laws, 1792, and Eulogy for the Revolt of the Revolutionaries, 1793. Saad argued for a constitutional monarchy in the 1791 address, and in the 1792 pamphlet, The Method for the Ratification of Laws by Local Agencies of Active Citizens. Philip and Edmund Wilson note that Saad broke most of his own rules for writing good fiction in his Libertine novels. In his eulogy of 1793, Saad referred to Marat as sublime martyrs of liberty. Phillips, Gray, and others have wondered whether these writings reflect Saad's true political beliefs or were simply parodies or political expedients to avoid persecution as an ex aristocrat. Letters and Journals More than 200 letters, mostly to his wife, have been made public since Saad's death. Bongi calls his prison letters his greatest literary achievement. Richard Seaver says the prison letter tells us more about this mysterious man than any other work. 
Phillips warns that Saad often played a role and created a fictionalized version of himself in these letters and journals. Saad also wrote journals in 1807 to 1808 and 1814. Legacy For centuries, Saad's descendants viewed his life and works as a scandal that needed to be silenced. This changed in the mid-20th century, however, when the Marquis de Saad took back the Marquis title, which had long been in decline, and became interested in his ancestors' writings. He discovered a collection of Saad papers in his family's chateau in the town of Condé, and worked for decades with scholars to have them published. The Marquis' youngest son, Thibault, continues this work today. The family also holds a trademark for the name. In 1983, the family sold the Chateau of Condé. In addition to the manuscripts they keep, others are kept at universities and libraries, but many were lost during the 18th and 19th century. A large number of them were destroyed after his death at the urging of his son-in-law, the Marquis de Sade. In the 19th century, Pierre Cardin purchased the Chateau de Lacoste at the town of Lacoste and restored it to its former glory. The castle has since been used for theatrical and music festivals. The documents discovered in 1948 served as the foundation for Gilbert Lely's seminal biography of Saad, published in 1952 and 1957 in two volumes. Since 1949, volumes of Saad's letters, journals, and other personal papers have been published gradually. In 1966, a 30-volume edition of Saad's complete works was published in France. From 1990, his works have been published in the French edition of the Pleiad. Thank you for taking the time to engage with our content. We're delighted you enjoyed this article and would love to hear your feedback. Your feedback is really valuable to us, so please share it in the comments box below. If you're new and want to remain up to date on our latest material, subscribe to the Up First Time channel. By subscribing, you will be the first to learn about our new stories and videos, ensuring that you never miss out on any of the excitement. But we're more than just distributing material, we're also about creating a community. That is why we value your feedback so highly. If you have any recommendations or themes you'd like us to look into more, please leave them in the comments. We're always looking for new ideas and eager to hear from our viewers. And, speaking of ideas, if you're as enthusiastic about this subject or person as we are, have you considered doing a whole documentary? Your unique thoughts and viewpoints could be extremely beneficial to others, and presenting them in a documentary style could help you reach an even larger audience. This is something to think about. Finally, remember to click the like button and share this video with your friends and family. Let's work together to expand our community and welcome new members to the Up First Time family. Your support is invaluable to us, and we could not do it without you. Thank you again for your support, and we look forward to continuing this great journey with you.